Thank you all very much for coming. Um, we advertised this at quite short notice, so we're grateful that anyone's come at all, and particularly to your quality audience, um, and thank you. My name is Suzanne Rain. I work uh, with Brendan and Bill at the Centre for Geopolitics, and um, the purpose of today is to really talk about a simulation exercise that we've been running during the day with um, Professor Brendan Sims's M. Phil students. Uh, and we do this on a regular basis, and we're going to explain a bit more about it uh, in detail. And, and, and this panel is going to talk through what we learnt during that. But in order to do that, first of all, Adam Wer, who uh, runs the simulations for us, is going to stand up and explain what happened today. Great. Um, thank you. No, nice to see you all. And um, uh, apologies for... Um, uh, the heat. Imagine you're wearing a tweed jacket as well. I can. <laughs> so, um, as uh, as Suzanne uh, said, um, uh, these public talks come on the back of a closed event that we uh, run um, at the moment. We're doing them every six months or so. Um, by way of background, I'm a uh, long-standing uh, uh, employee of the Foreign Office. Um, but I am here really in my capacity as an affiliate of the centre, and I studied um, uh, for an MPhil uh, here with Brendan uh, nine years ago, I think it is now. And um, after that experience, we um, sort of ended up in a conversation, I think on a train down to, to London, about how there was a sort of space uh, for bringing um, academia and uh, uh, government and uh, uh, connected interests um, together in a sort of uh, live exercising uh, scenario. Um, this is done um, a fair bit um, uh, by US universities, um, uh, Yale and Harvard both do it, but it isn't really done um, uh, in any uh, concerted sense on this side of the Atlantic, so we thought we would uh, give it a go. Um, and. Um, really just to situate this for the discussion and to spread the word about what we're doing. Um, I'll just explain a little bit about how, how it works. Uh, what we try to do over the course of a day is we try to simulate, we do simulate, um, uh, a growing crisis in which the UK has a significant um, uh, strategic interest. And um, we set out the scenario with a brief at the beginning of the day and then we place um, uh, people who have sat in various hot seats, like Amber, in Amber's case, as Home Secretary. Uh, we have serving and former senior officials, ambassadors, generals, admirals, air marshals, and the like. Uh, and around the table, we also have the master students who are all given roles to play uh, as the scenario unfolds. And as the day rolls out, we uh, inject uh, developing media stories, uh, intelligence reports, uh, and as uh, in real life, unexpected events. And we play the scenario in real time. We uh, set it in the COBRA room, so the emergency situation room in Whitehall where decisions get made. Uh, we have um, uh, somebody of deep experience and high repute like Amber uh, stepping into the role of Prime Minister and um, the discussion and the decisions that are made are made in the same way and with the same tone and the same sort of discussion that you would get in a real life crisis situation. So turning to what we did today, and this is the first time that we've set such a thing in um, the uh, uh, sort of Asian um, Indo-Pacific um, uh, region, and um, what we um, uh, started off with was a, um, in broad terms, a scenario where a British civilian research vessel, scientific uh, vessel, uh, got into trouble um, in the disputed waters of the South China Sea, uh, and um, uh, it was assisted um, by uh, Chinese military craft who came from uh, one of the facilities the Chinese have built there, and the ship was escorted with um, its crew, who were mainly Brits, uh, back into one of these facilities uh, which are under dispute, and we'll hear more about that, uh, and there it remains. Um, at the same time, there's a growing strategic crisis. Tensions uh, are ratcheting up um, over Taiwan, and this whole scenario is set 
uh, two months um, outside the uh, next US presidential election. So it's all in that frame. And then to add a little bit of uh, piquancy into uh, this situation, uh, we had President Biden uh, falling ill in the middle of it, and a US domestic um, uh, element questions over the presidency. Trump is, uh, again, the Republican candidate, and how this rising, all these rising tensions are playing into uh, what's going on. To further complicate matters for the UK, the UK's carrier strike group, so our aircraft carrier and associated uh, craft, submarines, um, air patrol, uh, um, uh, aircraft and so on, um, are in the vicinity. And so what that does for the British cabinet and British decision makers is mean that inaction is not an option because we've got a big warship sitting there and not doing something with it will send a signal which will be interpreted by various people uh, in the mix. So um, all of these um, uh, elements are sort of sloshing uh, around and um, uh, we ran that through and we'll hear more about that during the discussions, um, I think. Um, what we came out with, really, as findings, if you like, and I won't go through the sort of play of what happened because, in a way, that's slightly incidental, but what we found was that um, in this Indo-Pacific region, despite a sort of political, um, uh, you know, sentiment that we are tilting towards it or part of a tilt towards it along with the, the US, it remained through the scenario quite difficult to identify what um, the UK's uh, actual strategic interests were in the region when this crisis, crisis emerged. So that created quite a lot of conversation in the room about what, what is it that we really need to achieve out of this other than not getting into more trouble. Um, uh, there was a big theme uh, of perception and reality in the crisis, and this is a common theme age old, but actually exacerbated by social media. And what we quickly found were actors in, in the scenario, the Chinese in particular, and indeed ourselves, were, were grabbing social media opportunities, which were sort of driving the pace uh, for the political decision makers, and, and that created some difficulties as well. With question marks over the stability of the US administration, what became achingly clear, and perhaps again something to discuss, is how much the UK, in a scenario like this, is dependent on the US for policy direction. Left with questions about what do we do with our ships and our airplanes uh, without a clear steer on that from um, the, the major allied partner in the region was very difficult for UK decision makers um, faced with that. So that, those were the themes. And then um, just to sort of conclude my little introduction, um, uh, to sort of underline the point of the simulation, it really is um, an educative uh, undertaking. It, what it's meant to uh, demonstrate to the students um, is the messy reality of taking life or death decisions for policymakers and politicians in particular, and how whilst you can study, and it is a fundamentally important part of, of, of the whole ecosystem, you can study the theory behind international relations and the history, being in the room and having to make decisions on limited information is something that it is very, very difficult to convey through a sort of a written account of a historical event. So by placing the students in the room, we hope to uh, give them a flavor of what it might be if they pursue a career, but just an insight into the kind of real human messiness of uh, decision-making and perhaps an insight into why um, sometimes clever, powerful people don't take the right decisions, not because they willfully don't want to, it's just because it is not possible to do it at the, at the time. So I'll, I'll stop and then hand back to you, uh, Suzanne, and you might have some comments on, on this and, um, and we'll get the discussion going. Thank you, Adam. So I'm going to start by introducing the panel. Um, it's a very distinguished panel with a lot of expertise across all the different aspects that Adam has been talking about. So um, Amber Rudd, right honourable Amber Rudd, um, was our 
Home Secretary in the UK for three years from 2016 to 2018, which included the extremely eventful 2017, where we had um, a series of terrorist attacks um, which and a general election actually in the middle of it. So, um, <laughs> Uh, in the middle, Professor Bill Hurst. Bill is the Chonghua, sorry, I might not have said that exactly right, Professor of Chinese Development here at the University of Cambridge and is also the Deputy Director of the Centre for Geopolitics and a real expert on China and uh, East and Southeast Asia. And then um, immediately to my right, Dr. Tom Grant, who is a Fellow of the Lauterpak Centre for International Law here at the University of Cambridge, but has also recent experience as a practitioner working in the US State Department from 2019 to 21 in the Office of the Undersecretary of Arms Control and International Security. So this question about um, academia and practice and how the one can be most useful to the other is something that we're, we're constantly trying to explore at the Centre for, for Geopolitics and, and Tom's direct experience having been for 20 years in Cambridge, then going and working in State Department and coming back, be really interesting. Um, uh, and he played our Attorney General, which was um, educative. So I think I'm going to start, um, Bill, by asking you to set the scene a bit more. At lunchtime, you talked about that region, where, you know, the South China Sea and the countries that, that sort of sit around it. And, and I think particularly in light of the fact that the UK very explicitly said it was going to tilt to the Indo-Pacific, it's worth us understanding from your perspective what that region looks like and what a tilt in that direction would, would mean. I think it's a lot easier to answer the first of your questions than the second. Um, in the South China Sea for over a thousand years has been perhaps the most important nexus in the world of flows of people, goods, information, and ideas, uh, as well as capital. Uh, a very, very high percentage of global trade passes through this body of water. Uh, it's roughly the same size as the European Union in land area, um, about half the size of Australia or the continental United States. Uh, it's rather large in UK reference terms. Um, and it is crisscrossed by shipping lanes, fishing areas, uh, deposits of natural resources and the like. There are also a series of important and cross-cutting territorial claims, famously from China, the Nine Dash Line, uh, but also from states including the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, Vietnam uh, that are not necessarily recognized internationally uh, and certainly not by all the parties uh, to this. There have been a series of disputes around this uh, for a number of years. And so I think if we read the Integrated Review Refresh, uh, in which China is defined as the, quote unquote, I think, epoch-defining systemic challenge, it's not clear what that means. It's also not clear yet to me, and I think this really came out quite starkly today, what the British national security interest exactly is in this part of the world. Uh, so I think there's a very clear economic interest, obviously, with so much trade flowing in the area. Uh, a number of important partners for the UK are located in or near the region. Um, there's lots and lots of, of trade and investment flows. Um, there's also, I think, a clear uh, definition of kind of an interest in values uh, or, or uh, sort of philosophical uh, priorities uh, in this area and with regard to the countries near it. Uh, but the security interest is less obvious. And I think in the event of a crisis, it behooves the UK to articulate to itself and potentially also to the rest of the world exactly what that security interest is and exactly what kinds of trade-offs of other kinds of interests like values or economic uh, interests uh, Britain is willing to make in order to advance that security agenda. Uh, and so the other thing that came up very starkly today is if important partners such as the US are not easily available or are sending mixed messages or are in other ways not necessarily the sort of constant partner that, that, that one might expect, uh, 
to whom should the UK turn? Um, is there a domestic uh, apparatus capable of crafting uh, strategy and implementing policy uh, in a security space uh, reliably or not? Uh, and the other thing that didn't come up, to my chagrin to some extent, is are there other partners worth talking to in a systematic and sort of formative way? And I would suggest that besides Australia and Japan, uh, who are obvious in the region as, as security partners for the UK, much deeper and more uh, regularized, routinized dialogue, not just with Malaysia and Singapore, but also especially with Thailand, Indonesia, and potentially Vietnam, would be extraordinarily fruitful. Um, so there, there are ways that this could evolve, uh, but before doing that, I think it's very important to define just what the security objectives are. Uh, for the UK, what is the national interest? Uh, and I, I don't think, unfortunately, that that's clear, at least from what I've seen. Thank you, Bill. And I'm going to ask Amber now to talk about her experience of taking decisions in a crisis. But just, um, just to, so it's really clear for you all what the scenario was, there were essentially two, two bits of crisis playing out. And the first was the, the micro one, which was the British vessel which had 21 British citizens on. So the government has to decide how it's going to get them home. And if you're thinking about it, that's, that's on the news. And then, and then the, the macro one is significantly increased tensions over Taiwan. So, so those are the two sort of geopolitical, well, one's a geopolitical issue. One is, a, is essentially a consular issue that is also a geopolitical issue. And Amber, you've been in a lot of these crisis meetings. Um, talk us through, you know, that, I suppose, the relationship between the, 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 the decision maker, the minister, the people providing the information, how it, how it feels and how, how taking a decision works. Thank you. Um, so I would say that um, this one was particularly complicated, thank you. <laughs> but um, they're always quite complicated. It's never just, uh, I mean, if, if, if there was a black and white answer, you wouldn't really be calling COBRA. You'd just be going through, the, um, the, going through it by rote in some way. So the purpose of a COBRA meeting is to address the complications and the sort of competing interests. And it's, it's, it's a platform in which you've got, obviously, the prime minister. Well, not always the prime minister. I often chaired COBRAs when they were based on um, something which was predominantly UK national as home secretary. And if it's if it's um, an international event, usually the first COBRA is chaired by the foreign secretary. And then if it gets um, to becoming a major issue, the prime minister will chair it. But they, the prime minister, he or she, will make that decision for you. Um, but the, um, the purpose of it is to be able to give the decision makers, whoever's chairing COBRA, access to what we believe is all the relevant information. And in my situation, uh, for instance, over the Skripal poisoning, we had the leader of Wiltshire Council there. We had the head chief medical officer. We had the people who were really relevant to the decision making necessary over you know, the poisoning of a British citizen on British land. So um, in this scenario, we had a whole lot of different people not to do with so much UK homeland security, much more to do with international affairs and military. And actually, I think, as you, as you commented um, earlier, there was quite a lot of detailed discussion about um, what military capabilities we had, how soon they could move, what was expected of us from the Americans, what was expected of us from um, uh, the Chinese. And in terms of the, the, the big decision taking place and you know, the UK government now, which way it tilts, I was struck during the uh, discussions that our relationship with China as the UK has changed so much over 15 years. And in 2010 to 15, our relationship with China was much more trying to bring them into the rules-based system, trying to make sure we worked with them, having Huawei in our technology and our 5G chain. And all that went out after 2015. We had Chinese state investment in Hinkley Point, in other parts of our infrastructure. And now, when we think about what our UK foreign policy is in that region, I would say it is um, almost entirely to do with our relationship with China. 
And that was what the challenge was on the decision making we had today. It was how are we going to not escalate with China? Um, and if we didn't have the US sort of viable in a way, in, in our scenario, we had the US sort of giving us two contrary uh, policies because they're in the middle of an election period, so we couldn't put any weight on them. What was the UK's position? And I think that revealed, as, as has just been said, the fact that the UK's position, position in that arena is unclear if it's not just what does America think or how can we influence America. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because it's trying to make sure that the West works as a unit rather than working independently. But without knowing what the US was thinking, it kind of reveals really the fact that the UK is not going to have independent agency um, confronting China. So when we talk about the very phrase South China Sea, I would say that's kind of shorthand for uh, what's China up to and is it dangerous? And that kind of was the nub of what we were discussing. Alongside that, some of the participants in the uh, mock Cobra today were slightly surprised that I, as the sadly just pretend prime minister, um, kept saying things like, but what do my constituents think? What will the voters think? And I'm gonna to have to make a statement to parliament. What will the MPs think? And really what that came down to is how we're going to get the 21 people back. Um, the British citizens that have basically been held, we believed, perhaps benignly, perhaps kindly, we don't know. And my focus as prime minister was much more on finding out more about them. And some of the brilliant brains around the room were like, why isn't she thinking about the long-term strategy for UK foreign policy? But actually the truth is, the MPs around the room, the Foreign Secretary, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, will be leaving that meeting and be having to talk to people. So you've got to arm them with a narrative which is showing that we are protecting British people. So those, were, I think, were the most important things I took out of it. Thank you. I'm going to come back to the question about um, escalation and de-escalation, because yes. I think it's, it's really interesting. But before I do, I want to um, get Tom to speak. Uh, Tom, as Attorney General, um, proper lawyer, one of the things that's so important is, in these discussions is to ground it in what would be lawful action and what would not be lawful action. And in this case, whether the Chinese have, have acted lawfully in the first place. Tom explained masterfully to us um, how complicated it is in that area. And, and you talked, could you start from the beginning with Chinese claims, because there's a lot of history to it. Suzanne, so thank you very much, sure. Glad to do, uh, glad to uh, go, uh, have a, give you a, a, an overview of the inter international law of the South China Sea, which is really the international law of the law of the sea. And the law of the sea is a general law, but it's also been codified in something called the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, as the acronym is usually uh, uh, pronounced. And UNCLOS uh, is a treaty to which the United Kingdom is party, so is China. So the principal protagonists in the scenario that we were addressing today are active participants in this part of international law. The United States, which is uh, largely on the sidelines of the scenario for the reasons that uh, might, uh, were explained, uh, is not a uh, party to UNCLOSE, but adheres to many of the main rules and principles of the law of the sea and views itself as a guarantor of many of the most important components of that law. Now, China uh, has this long-standing sort of historical assertion about the South China Sea, uh, as, ref as reflected in what Bill referred to as the nine-dash line. The line is a line shown on Chinese maps that has been shown on Chinese maps for many years. In 2009, China made diplomatic demarches about the Nine Dash Line, saying that the line reflects a Chinese sovereign position across the sea, but it was very ambiguous. Uh, China has been ambiguous about exactly what its claims and assertions are in the South China Sea. There are two main wellsprings of China's legal theory in the region. One is this historical concept that somehow China has something akin to sovereign rights over the oceans. Now, one of the basic precepts of the modern law of the sea, when I say modern, I mean the law that emerged 500 or 600 years ago, is that you cannot own the sea, you cannot have sovereignty in the sea. Um, in 2016, a UN Law of the Sea Convention Tribunal, an NX7 tribunal, uh, 
adjudicated a claim by the Philippines against China. And the claim had many different heads, but a very important part of the Philippines' claim was against China's assertion of sovereign rights on the basis of this rather vague historical claim. The tribunal was pretty clear that there is no historic grounding to a Chinese sovereignty claim over the waters in the South China Sea. And now, sort of as a parenthetical, it's important to understand that in the South China Sea, there are lots of islands. An island, a territorial feature, or a rock, which is a very small island, is one thing, that the sea is another thing. The United States, the United Kingdom, Japan, Australia, are very resolutely agnostic about territorial claims. So what some hundreds of small islands or rocks are claimed almost in their entirety by China, almost in their entirety by Vietnam, in very large part by the Philippines, in some part by Malaysia, in a very tiny part by Brunei. So you have this complex overlapping of territorial claims about which we, speaking collectively as the US, UK, Japan, Australia, we take no position. What, however, uh, we do take a position on are the assertions of maritime rights in and around those many land features. And the problem with China's historicist claim is that that just doesn't sound in modern international law. You cannot have that sort of claim. After this 2016 decision, which China pretty badly lost, China came out with a novel theory to explain its presence in the region and to explain its belief that it has wide-ranging rights to the maritime areas of the South China Sea. What it said was that if you draw lines connecting the many small islands in the Spratly area, which is the southern area of the South China Sea, and the Paracels, which are up in the northern part of the sea, if you connect all those islands, you get this great grand block and the law of the sea, according to China, allows you to assert archipelagic baseline rights in that fashion. Now, there's a shred of reality to the concept of archipelagic baselines. First of all, sorry for the forensic detail, but without it, none of this makes sense. A baseline is the place from which you measure your maritime entitlement. You could do it from a beach, but countries are permitted to draw baselines that connect land points, and then it's from your baseline that you measure your 12-mile territorial sea entitlement and your 200-mile exclusive economic zone entitlement, the EEZ. Now, if you are a so-called archipelagic state, that is a country which is an island, you are entitled to draw what we call archipelagic baselines encircling your islands. Because usually an island state is not just one island. Nauru is just one island. But usually an island state has lots of islands like Indonesia, the archipelagic state par excellence. The convention gives some special privileges to archipelagic states. They can draw baselines around their whole, and that kind of expands maritime jurisdiction. But the law is very clear that there are limitations on how and where you draw these lines. There are formulae governing the ratio between space that you enclose that happens to be maritime and the space that happens to be land. In other words, it has to be quite a bit of land in order to make your archipelago <coughs> eligible for this exercise. China's proposal to encircle these entirety, most of the South China Sea in archipelagic baselines, so-called, is not a little bit outside the law, not a medium size outside the law. It is orders of magnitude outside the accepted ratios. And there are no other cases on Earth that resemble that sort of assertion of maritime right based on archipelagic status. This is the UK legal position as articulated to Parliament after the 2016 award and then elaborated upon in 2020. Now, playing the role of attorney general, I, 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 I endeavored to be true to the 2020 UK parliamentary statement, which sets out really a quite sound, not very argumentative assessments of China's position in the South China Sea. Um, uh, and the reason this is relevant to our scenario is that China detained the UK vessel in our scenario at Mischief Reef, 
Mischief Reef is a place, uh, it's not an island, it's not a rock, it's a low tide elevation. Uh, in other words, when you get to highest tide, it's underwater. That sort of feature has zero entitlement of any kind unless it happened to be really close to your land. If it's within 12 miles of your land, you can use it as a separate base point and thus push out your entitlement. This is uh, well, it's 600 miles from China, but it's within 200 miles of Philippines. And the tribunal in 2016 and the UK in 2020 are quite clear. It's part of the Philippine EEZ, EEZ. And so it's in an area subject to navigational freedom. That's another point of importance. EEZs are not subject to constraints on navigation. You may sail through an EEZ as you please. Uh, so the ship in the scenario was detained in a place where uh, it had every right to be doing its business. Actually, whatever that business was, mm -hmm. there was a side issue as to whether it was a vessel with uh, spy craft going on or if it was a purely scientific vessel. But the point is, Mischief Reef was directly adjudicated between Philippines and China and the United Kingdom along with Japan, Australia, the United States, and the EU actually have been very clear that that part of the ocean is simply not subject to a maritime entitlement by anybody, except the Philippines on the basis of the 200 mile extension from the Philippines baselines. So the Attorney General probably would have called in aid the legal advisor of the FCDO on this one. Uh, but um, I think at one point, I, I suppose we might have delved into more but didn't was the relation between this kind of nitty gritty law and the larger strategic issue of what is the UK interest in that part of the world, why should we care at all, apart from the interests in protecting the 21 UK citizens on the boat. Uh, I suppose in the international law there is to some extent an answer and that is we've seen ourselves as a guarantor of this system and a beneficiary of freedom of the seas and really if you reframe the issue as one that's really about freedom of navigation then you start to at least potentially explain to the wider public why it really could matter a lot for United Kingdom uh, interests. But um, that's, uh, that, that's sort of the less granular uh, uh, relevance of, uh, of, the, of a legal take on the uh, problems. And thankfully, we didn't get into very pointed questions such as, will it be lawful to do X, Y, or Z? We were about to, we though. We getting there, though. Yeah. But the fact, if I may, um, the fact that, as you have so clearly set out, they were outside the legal agreement, the international agreements, does suggest that it was a more hostile act than perhaps we allowed ourselves to think this morning when we thought it could be quite benign, in fact. They were just helping these 21 people or just... But they might have been actually... They could have ignored it. They were deliberately showing, flouting the legal agreements in order to test the response, would you say? It, it does look like it was an, an attempt to test, but... Just to be clear, it didn't actually happen. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We got so into the role play. <laughs> Sorry, don't, don't you. I, I would just point out a, a couple of things. One is that this kind of testing on both sides uh, goes on every day. Yeah. So there, there's testing of you know, how far can China extend its control effectively uh, over parts of the South China Sea uh, in contravention to some of these uh, legal principles or, or indeed rulings uh, from UNCLOS and others uh, versus how much can the US, the UK, Japan, France, et cetera, uh, assert freedom of navigation rights in the areas that China has claimed uh, without provoking a, a, an undue uh, response. Uh, and so the, this sort of back and forth testing is, is kind of a constant. Um, another thing I would mention is that this idea of sort of Taiwan as a macro scenario, I think is, is not quite right because I think it's a separate scenario. Right, we have sort of the Taiwan scenario as one, South China Sea is another. There's a temptation among many people to link them, but I think that that's actually counterproductive, or at least potentially counterproductive. Um, they're not necessarily linked. They could be linked, but they probably aren't. And to assume a linkage is to complicate a situation that may actually be simpler than, than, than one thinks. Um, the last thing I'll say on this is that I think it's tempting not just for the UK, but for a number of countries now, um, mostly from outside the immediate vicinity, uh, 
to treat all relationships in East or Southeast Asia as what are we doing about China or what does this mean for our bilateral relationship uh, with China. That's not the only relationship in play, right? There, there's lots of other relationships that are arguably just as important or even more important, uh, and not just with a place like Japan or South Korea, um, but in Southeast Asia as well. And I think a, a, a truly, not just multilateral, but multifaceted approach and, and sort of even serially bilateral approach uh, to all of these very, very different states with very different interests might be much more productive than thinking of the whole thing as a grand game between China versus others. The very last little aside I'll, I'll mention is that the earliest foundation, at least as I would frame it, of the whole tradition of law of the sea and establishment of freedom of navigation is probably Grotius's uh, De Jure Praedae Commentarius from about 1620, I believe he wrote it, when he was retained as the attorney for the Dutch East India Company uh, who were being taken uh, to court in a case over their allegedly illegal seizure of a Portuguese merchant ship off the coast of Johor. So in the South China Sea, illegal seizure of a ship by a private uh, marine, essentially, that, that, that did this. Um, and that's where we really we get this whole doctrine coming from. So the idea that there are contested waters and contested sovereignty over those waters and disputes over things like freedom of navigation and the assertion of military authority in areas that otherwise might be uh, open to everyone's economic or, or other activity are not new, right? The, 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 these kinds of questions have been at the heart of exactly the debates that gave rise to all of these legal structures and institutions um, that we now point to as sort of settled law um, or, or supposedly settled law. Um, and, and so in that sense, what we're seeing today is really of a piece with a series of debates, struggles, and, and confrontations that have been going on for centuries uh, in different forms and in different parts of the world. Uh, and in that sense, it's not easy to settle or just end uh, by pointing to some decision or statute or convention. One of the things that, um, that really came across is the difficulty of interpreting the, all the other players' actions. So, so if, if you're sitting there being a British official, you're trying to interpret Chinese actions, you're trying to interpret American actions, you're trying to interpret Chinese interpretations of your actions. Um, and, and so, so exactly. So, so, so you're, and, and, and at the heart of that then is, is when you're deciding what to do next, is this question about whether they're escalating whether they're, whether they're escalating in order to escalate or in order to de-escalate, and conversely, whether in order, if, you're, if your objective is to de-escalate, whether you achieve that best by escalation or, or de-escalation. And Amber, I think we ended up deciding that we were going to seek de-escalation through de-escalation. Yes, but we also... Um, we, it, it was a very good representation of um, how much uncertainty there is, because you are, because the, the Prime Minister or the Home Secretary or Foreign Secretary will turn to somebody in the meeting and say, well, what does China think? Or what does China, and they're thinking like, oh my Lord, Lord. You know, they've just got a slightly, I'm sure they are, got a huge capacity of intelligence, but there's a lot of guesswork going into it. And so what we also concluded was that we were going to go through some back channels to try and find some uh, better intelligence that the Chinese, for instance, might want us to have without actually telling us they wanted us to have it. So the diplomatic channels in that in instant were going to be critical. Mm. Yeah. Do you escalate to de-escalate? Lawyers have a slightly different take on things uh, in the sense that it's when we fail it's when we have when we have failed that the uh, military or naval options are on the table. Uh, in the region, the, the Indo-Pacific, I mean, there is a, a perhaps some difference in perception um, in, in governments there uh, among the different dispute settlement options, uh, short of fighting it out at sea, that uh, countries might uh, employ. China took an extremely hostile 
view toward the Philippine suit. Uh, the Philippines uh, brought the suit uh, under a binding compulsory procedure, Annex 7 of the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, the, the sense that one gets from China's communications during and after th those proceedings is that there's a great preference for voluntary or mediation style engagements rather than compulsory binding procedures. This is the one thing that came up in the scenario we talked about possible UN solutions going to UN in one form or another to one or another UN organ. We also talked about the possibility of third party good offices or mediation or whatever title you might put on it. Uh, we talked about a couple of different countries in the region that might have been candidates for stepping in to assist the UK and China to talk about the matter. And it just, it, it, you don't want to sort of essentialize and say, well, in the Far East, they just have a different view, but there are different views. Uh, I suppose some, some of it is historical or cultural, but the idea of an adversary courtroom proceeding uh, tends to dr go over like a lead balloon in Beijing, but maybe not just Beijing, but maybe other regional capitals. Um, so the idea of something that takes a much softer approach, such as third party good offices or mediation, uh, so it entered our discussion. We, we sort of nibbled around the edges of that idea. Um, and I think we, did, we decided that we would open a channel to talk about the possibility of a third state. Well, I, I think another aspect of this, though, that's quite important is that there can be, and I think there very often are, uh, de-escalatory moves or conciliatory, at least on the surface, conciliatory moves that can sort of push the other side into revealing something about in their internal decision making or intentionality or objectives that then can inform what we think is going to be necessary in terms of either dialogue or concessions. Uh, so, for example, a certain kind of public response to the scenario in which China had detained the crew of a British ship um, at, a, at a military base uh, could reveal whether this was incidental or even accidental escalation on the part of China, or in fact a considered action with a specific other objective. And if we know what that is likely to be, whether it was considered action or accidental, um, then we could take a much better decision as to, well, what should our objective be going into talking about this? Um, is it likely that there's going to be a demand for concession? Is it likely that this can be resolved very quickly with sort of minimal escalation from either side? Um, and in the end, I don't think we quite got all the way to the conclusion of that. But I think that's something that is worth exploring, not just in this part of the world, not just for the UK, not just in this particular kind of scenario, but all over the place. Uh, and I'm sure it is explored quite, quite uh, frequently in, in other uh, settings. Uh, but it's something that often gets de-emphasized in these kinds of conversations that you know sort of a, a, a soft move can allow or indeed compel a particular player in an interaction to reveal preferences or objectives uh, or even think, thinking processes uh, in ways that can be helpful uh, to figuring out how best then to approach a resolution. I mean I, in, in this simulation we were without sort of any, any firm view from the US and uh, we, was, we didn't have enough at the time when we were discussing it, back channels to know really what China was up to. We were worried about the 21. Uh, but it, it did feel that one of the discussions that we had was whether China would also feel uh, the US aren't involved at the moment because they've got their own crisis. Great, let's go for Taiwan. That's the connection in a way. It created potentially an opportunity there. And then we didn't know really what the UK's position would be because... Uh, without the U.S., what is the U.K.'s position on Taiwan? I mean, I, 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 I mean one doesn't really want to look down that tunnel because it's not going to be terribly encouraging for the Taiwanese, I feel certain. Uh, but it is worth um, thinking whether, the, as you were saying, whether the U.K. government has thought through those things. What is U.K.'s agency in different areas, given what our interests are? And that's where we haven't got a military person on the panel, but we had a lot of discussion today about if you've got the carrier strike group in the region... Exactly as Andrew said, every, every decision that, you, you know, whichever direction you point it in is, is signalling something. And, and have you really thought through what that, how that signal might be interpreted? And, wasn't it? So, um, are there questions from the audience? 
you'd be very welcome to just pile into the discussion. Please, yes. Well, um, I think I'm trying to take a broader view of this, and I think this um, Chinese scenario accentuates a, a bigger problem that, that you referred to, um, with the US geopolitics being trying to get out of trouble or always de-escalate via de-escalation, um, especially without a clear steer from the US. And so I wanted to ask this broader question, maybe to Amber Rudd, uh, with your experience in government. Is this caused by um, domestic polarization? There is no ability to achieve consensus on you know, these strategic goals. Or it's just the reality of it that the, uh, there are limited resources, uh, much less than uh, ones needed to play the role that uh, Brits would expect their country to play. Um, well, it's, it's a million dollar question, really, isn't it? It's the, but the fact is that as we look at Ukraine, um, the Americans are providing five times the amount of uh, financial support as the whole of Europe. So th there is no you know, engagement at that level without the Americans being on the same side because you know, European couldn't. European, Europe overall and the, and the UK certainly couldn't sustain anything reasonable without the Americans. However, the Amer be, you know, finding out what the Americans want is not mean, A, doesn't mean necessarily that we do it, and B, doesn't mean necessarily that Parliament will accept it, as we found out in 2013 when Parliament refused to support what the Prime Minister wanted to do in support of Obama, in two, um, David Cameron and Obama. And so these, these things are still unknown, but there is a reality about the US being the big player. And they are the ones with the financial muscle and the might. And without them, many of these things can't be done. Anyone else has a view on that? It's just, that is, I would say, the view that I would take. I mean, there are many, uh, I think, smaller countries with smaller resources, but they still have clear policies. I'm not saying we don't have a clear policy. I'm just saying that you couldn't, for instance, decide to go up against the Chinese on Taiwan. Um, no. I think it raises a really interesting question because um, we're always using this phrase strategic ambiguity, particularly when we're talking about this region. Um, and quite a lot of things would fall clearly into that category here as well. So, th so the UK, I think, does know what it would like. Yes. Um, and it's also realistic about its, the levers that, that it, it can pull on its own. I mean, that, as Amber said, that's, that's the world. So, so what I think it, it's presumably, it's not helpful to say, in an ideal world, this is what we would like for Taiwan and this is blah, blah, blah. But, um, but we essentially don't have the capability to make that happen ourselves, so let's do nothing. So, so what you do is you set out what you want and then you try and work it. Sorry, in the, we had a discussion the other day about pragmatism and, and there's a sort of, there's a thread that says one of the elements of British foreign policy has always been to be pragmatic. Pragmatism doesn't give you an answer, really. Um, you can have lots of different pragmatic options, I suppose, but, but saying, well, this is what we want. So let's try and work with what we've got in the scenario that we've got to achieve the best that we can hope for, while recognising that there are so many other actors in everything that you can't actually shape it. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know whether you agree with that. I, I would just make two small points. One is that strategic ambiguity as a phrase has a very particular meaning when yes. applied to Taiwan, uh, and, and, in, and especially to US policy on Taiwan. Uh, I would argue that, that that ambiguity has been in decline for 20, 20 years, roughly. Yeah. Um, but prior to certainly the Chen shui administration in the first half of the 2000s, uh, or through most of the 2000s, um, it was important uh, as a cornerstone of kind of US policy in, in that part of the world. Um, so I think as a general concept, though, this idea of just ambiguity or, or, or multifaceted aspects of problems is important. And I think that then throws up the second point I would make, which is just that there's a distinction that I think is quite important between not being on the same side and always having to take direction or always having to be rigidly coordinated. Um, so the idea that you know, the UK couldn't act, potentially couldn't act, um, in the South China Sea without a clear steer from the United States that doesn't necessarily, 
it, what, what that seems to indicate is that the UK is not capable of acting independently. Uh, but independent action wouldn't necessarily be contrary to US interest either, right? It can be possible to be still very much allied, but not always acting directly in a coordinated way. And what that then also suggests is that other kinds of relationships, uh, other bilateral or multilateral relationships for the UK in the region, including, again, I would reiterate with Australia, Japan, but also Singapore, Malaysia, and other partners, um, that's really important. And those are really important to cultivate, sustain, uh, and nurture independent of whatever the US is doing. And all of those countries may very well, along with the UK, remain completely on side, so to speak, with the United States. I'm not suggesting that they wouldn't be. But it would then enable them to act in a more nimble, agile, and independent way without requiring this kind of hierarchical coordination that in our scenario today, wasn't there because of a domestic political crisis inside the United States. The gentleman in the um, pale peach shirt. Um, you mentioned that people often conflate uh, China's objectives in the South China Sea and in Taiwan. Could you possibly outline what the different motivations would be for each of those and why they are possibly, <coughs> sorry, possibly unrelated issues? Well, I think people conflate China's objectives, but I think they also conflate the issues more generally, and, and they really are quite different. Um, if we look at the issue around Taiwan, right? Taiwan is, a, is one island uh, off the coast of mainland China uh, that is claimed by the government of China as a province. Uh, it is also claimed officially by the government on Taiwan to be part of China. The only difference is the government on Taiwan recognizes that it has not been able to control the rest of the country for a very long time. Right? Officially, that, that is, that is the, the, the legal status. Um, that isn't necessarily what every political actor or voter or citizen in Taiwan would agree with. Um, certainly not. Right? There's a lot of diversity of opinion within Taiwan. Um, and so there's a kind of long-term stalemate about what happens with Taiwan. And the terms of that stalemate have shifted somewhat, right? If we go back to the 1950s, it was really about are uh, military forces from Taiwan going to try to retake the mainland, right? And in fact, the United States blockaded Taiwan during the Korean War to try to prevent uh, the, the KMT government from launching a military attack against China and potentially starting a much broader war. Um, that dynamic hasn't been there for a very long time. And then we had this kind of just agreement to you know, literally shell one another on alternate days uh, in, in some of the offshore islands uh, throughout the, from the late 50s until the 70s. And then increasingly since the 1980s, there's been more of a sort of push from the mainland to say, well, we could do something to pull Taiwan back into orbit with China. Um, and also a push in Taiwanese politics to potentially press for de, de jure as well as de facto independence, um, or even a declaration of independence, which would be quite inflammatory. I think where we're at now with Taiwan is actually a, a fairly stable status quo. I think that the, the risk of actual escalation is very low uh, in, in the Taiwan situation. Um, no political party that's likely to win any number of seats in the legislature, and certainly nobody that's going to win the presidency in Taiwan, actually advocates a formal declaration of independence anymore. The Democratic Progressive Party, which had certain wings of it, certainly had in the past, in the 80s and 90s, advocated that, has not, since coming to power with Chen Shui-bian's election in 2000, um, and certainly not now. Um, China, for its part, uh, the mainland China government uh, is not I think, interested in a military option vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. And so both have kind of settled into this status quo uh, stalemate, but also one that's quite productive economically, um, and, and more or less productive depending on exactly how both sides approach one another, um, and, and has now facilitated all kinds of things like direct flights, postal and telecom links, uh, and all kinds of economic flows that weren't there, uh, say, 25, 30 years ago. Right, those, those are all much newer than that. Actually, they're all really since 2008. If we look at the South China Sea, 
from China's point of view there, there are these kind of vague historic claims that were really first articulated, in fact, by the nationalist government uh, in the post-World War II period, the couple of years post-World War II. They were never challenged in a meaningful way by other allies uh, in terms of the post-war settlement issues. And then all of these states around the South China Sea became independent between the mid-1950s and the late 1960s, early 1970s. And the independence of all of those states then exerting their own claims, plus China increasingly stridently articulating its claim, really, especially since the 1980s, and the United States saying that it would be the guarantor of freedom of nav navigation in the region uh, using the US Navy, and particularly then in the context of broader regional conflicts that happened during the 1960s and 70s throughout that part of the world. Um, by the time we get to the 1980s, we have this very fraught climate uh, in which you have multiple claimants, multiple actors, and multiple issues in play. Uh, the amount of trade flowing through the area is, is really high, um, much higher than, than the Taiwan trade or Taiwan Straits uh, trade uh, globally. It's a much more global issue. It's a much more multifaceted, multilateral issue. Yet there is no place in the South China Sea, even from the hardest line point of view in Chinese politics, that is anywhere near as central a component of China as China conceives of its own sovereignty as Taiwan is. Right? There, there is no large island in the middle of the South China Sea populated for 500 years by ethnically Chinese, Chinese speakers um, that at one point had been a province of China with a government that claimed sovereignty over it. There's nothing even remotely like that. So it's, it's a very different kind of scenario from China's point of view. From others' point of view, um, it also is different. All of the major players, certainly in our scenario today, recognize that officially Taiwan is part of China and call upon both sides to resolve the issue in a peaceful way, et cetera. Um, so there, there is no question legally about sovereignty of Taiwan. There's a lot of questions around how to approach policy uh, with regard to guaranteeing Taiwan's security and uh, how that conflict should be settled. The South China Sea is not recognized uh, as part of China's sort of sovereign area of control or sphere of influence or anything else by any of the other players. And so in that sense, it's a very, very different game. The Taiwan situation really is two or three players. The South China Sea situation is at least seven or eight players uh, and even more complex. Uh, so in that sense, it's not stable. If the Taiwan situation is in a relatively stable equilibrium of long-term stalemate, even if the terms shift a little bit, and if now they fight with you know, missiles and, and naval maneuvers off the coast, rather than you know, shelling one another and, and fighter dog fights like in the 1950s. Um, the South China Sea situation is so fluid and so complex that the potential for miscalculation or miscommunication, in my view, is much, much higher. So if there's an area that's dangerous, it's the South China Sea, not Taiwan. Also, just to add to the point that it dif to <clears throat> differentiating between Taiwan and South China Sea, the uh, Chinese maps do go back deep into the 20th century uh, with the so-called Nine Dash Line. But it's actually two. I mean, the, the, the Philippines China Tribunal, in looking at the record, couldn't find a diplomatic note before 2009. Um, it was instigated because Vietnam and Malaysia had communicated a provisional continental shelf uh, limit map to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. China issued a dip what, what we believe, what people believe, what, what is understood to be, and the tribunal seemed to think, is the first formal diplomatic espousal by China of this line. So it just goes to Bill's point that with Taiwan, it's rock solid Chinese dogma. That's a sort of article of state of faith that Taiwan is a province of China. South China Sea is both ambiguous and relatively new. I don't think it's that new, actually, in the sense that we do see, again, the nationalist government in, in I think, 1947 articulating this, although not in exactly that written document uh, 
format that you've mentioned of, of a formal diplomatic note, but that was articulated, these maps were standard in the 1990s when I was a student in Taiwan. Yeah. The standard map in Taiwan included the nine dash line and all of Mongolia, by the way, as part of China with the proper government being, of course, the government in Taipei at that point because it couldn't control the rest of the country. Well, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't contest the historian's point, but if I'm running the foreign ministry or the attorney general's mm. office, um, uh, God forbid, um, I, I, I don't respond to textbooks. In fact, it would be a really big mistake to respond to textbooks. I do respond to notes at the UN. And in 2009, it, it, it's pretty much, the, it, it is, it's the first diplomatic at the UN, espousal, yeah. um, which it, it's, that, it, it's escalatory. Mm -hmm. But it's also, like you were saying, it's brand new compared to Taiwan. This is very new. So I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement. It's, it's a relatively new and relatively complex yeah. uh, matrix. Thank you both, gentlemen. Um, I've got loads of questions now. Um, oh, Brendan put his hand up. Um, Professor Sims. Yeah, so the, um... Thank you. The scenario uh, at the moment is one which is, is basically confined to East Asia. Um, this is a question really for Amber Rudd, um, uh, but maybe the others have comments as well. How would the scenario differ in a context of, of a war in, in Europe, which of course we already have? Um, and a simultaneous war in Europe and perhaps an escalation. So if there were a double escalation, how, how would the scenario then uh, shift, do you think? Well, I think it would then be all about NATO, really. Um, I mean, I, I expect you have a good answer on this, Brennan, too. But, I mean, it seems to me that it's completely different uh, if you've got established alliances and uh, treaties in place. And there would be a kind of urgency about it because it's on our doorstep and we're there in the same way there is with Ukraine, but even more so if it was a member of NATO. But what I mean is, what, would the salience of the East Asian crisis then recede in that context? You, oh, you mean if we had the East Asian crisis and then Europe? Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely, definitely it would be because it's, you know, it's, it's literally on your doorstep and it's about your own families going to war potentially if it was going to involve NATO. Um, so you're, you're both in, into, who wants to go first? So options are always very good. In your scenario, does the UK have any basing rights in the Far East? Does it have reciprocal agreements with its allies in that theatre of operations? Um, also, it's, it's quite interesting to hear that you feel that we, we don't have enough hard power to come to Taiwan's aid, and I would agree. But when it came to Hong Kong, I think the Foreign Secretary of the day, Dominic Raab, offered something like a million visas to be fast-tracked for Hong Kongers. Um, this didn't sit well with the Chinese, but it was more kind of a economic or human capital leverage. And I believe there has been quite an influx of Hong Kongers into the country. So similarly, Taiwan has a lot of human and finance capital. We see the US is actually enticing companies to build chip factories in the US. This is something that the UK could also undertake. So there are elements of economic leverage that we can take. And my final point, um, I'm not up on my maritime law, but has the US ratified the law of the sea? And seeing as it hasn't, surely that's kind of a crack in Western unity. Well, I, I can just take, if I may, to take a portion of that question, which is on, on Hong Kong, that was a, an obligation which the UK had to people in Hong Kong. And that was always going to be followed through, in my view, although it was uh, absolutely the right thing for, uh, for people in Hong Kong when it was. They must have had some anxiety about it. But that's about our heritage with Hong Kong. Taiwan, nothing, not, not, not at all similar. Although I do observe, you're absolutely right, that the Americans have decided to protect industry against Chinese, Chinese taking over Taiwan, should it ever happen, whatever small the amount that is, uh, on the basis of having both the Inflation Reduction Act, so-called, and the CHIPS Act. Very simple. But I would say that is part of the whole change in policy between the US and China. And therefore, well, not just therefore, but the fact is, as I, as I said earlier in my remarks, the UK used to take the view that we could deal with China, we could be the friend of China, we could invest in the Asia Infrastructure Bank. The Americans were furious with us. 
um, that we could work with Huawei. Again, the Americans weren't happy. In the end, we agreed with them, and we took a few. We, we no longer we no longer do that. And so I think that the the sort of bifurcation which you've got to a certain extent with the West and with China on technology, particularly because there's just too much Chinese technology, say the politicians, in all our tech, and we have more and more tech, and we have more and more dependence and excitements with AI, etc. And to have that dependent in China is going to be problematic. And in America, they've been very specific about it. They do not want their cars made in China. They want them made in Denver. And that's why they're throwing so much money at it. Mm. Mm. Do you want to do the legal? Yeah, j just to add to Amber's point, yeah. I, mean, I, I see it the other way around on UNCLOS, the convention. The United States indeed is not a party, but the United States adheres to the rules, and not only adheres to the rules, but promotes the rules that form really the backbone of the convention. Um, it's in fact, I mean, it's demonstrative of the underlying strength of the rules. They're not just propositions that a couple of UN committees drafted over the course of a decade leading to 19 early 1980s, but instead it's a sort of reflection of much more, much more fundamental understandings about freedom of navigation and many different principles that pivot on the freedom of navigation. So whilst some people, the United States is still in a debate, it's a long, slow moving debate about whether to ratify the convention, uh, but in, in a sense, it either doesn't matter or in fact further evidences, further evinces the uh, foundational character of the rules that the uh, convention expresses. I mean, we're not, the United States doesn't belong to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, but re quite routinely affirms the points that count in the treaty, uh, most of the points, which again suggests that the Law of Treaties Convention isn't just a sort of uh, imaginative exercise by treaty drafters, but instead it's a reflection of something larger, so. so why yeah. Good question. A, a number of institutional problems. Uh, I think the parts of the convention that upset American decision makers the most are the most novel parts, the parts that especially deal with the deep seabed. I think what some of this is also pointing at is the fact that domestic politics structures decision making in international relations to a much greater extent than we're sometimes tempted to believe. And that's true in China, it's true in Taiwan, it's true in the UK, it's true in the US. Um, you know, we see this time and time and time again. So I, I would submit that a major reason why the United States has not ratified UNCLOS is domestic politics and has been really from the beginning. I also think a major reason why the UK did not extend something like the BNO settlement scheme a lot earlier, as mm -hmm. arguably it could have or should have, um, was because of domestic politics. And the reason it shifted when it did, and I would agree made the right decision ultimately, was also domestic politics. Yeah, I would agree, yeah. Um, and, and that uh, you know, it would have been very difficult, in other words, to extend sort of the potential for settlement to 650,000 people in the midst of a rather anti-immigration yeah. Brexit debate. But at the moment it happened, something else took precedent in, in domestic politics. It was, mm -hmm. it was feasible. Uh, and also the same in terms of the way that China approaches the South China Sea claims. A lot of it actually is about posturing in domestic politics of different players inside China and exactly how those claims are going to be articulated or advanced um, sometimes is not at all reliant on what Vietnam has done or what the Philippines are doing or the US freedom of navigation operations or indeed if there were a British ship that ran aground um, and, and in fact has all to do with what's going on inside Chinese politics. So I think it's, it's important to keep that in mind in any of these scenarios that we look at and with regard to all of these countries. And so when we think about a bilateral interaction even, not even multilateral, what's going on inside of each of those two states is often more important than what we could look at sort of structurally in the international arena. Brian Chen. Thank you. Uh, Brian Trim, recent completion, recently completed the uh, MPhil in Polis. Um, looking at the integrated review refresh, which we started out on, uh, and the realities on the ground, there's a clear hierarchy of interest. And you've touched on the fact that security in Europe is obviously much higher 
a priority for Britain, and, and therefore we have to ask ourselves after today's simulation, what exactly are our interests in the Indo-Pacific and where do they fall in those interests? I would suggest they are longer range and less urgent, not necessarily of lesser gravity. But we've also seen the difficulty of, of articulating that position without a, a strong US lead. And so when we're reaching out to the regional partners in the, in the so-called tilt and trying to develop new relationships and so on, it feels rather like we have a bit of a say-do gap. We're, we're very little present in the region. We're making quite large statements which don't actually align with what everybody else can see our priorities are. So what do we do about that gap? It, it, where do we find credibility when we're actually dealing with the smaller states? And I think you mentioned uh, Thailand and Vietnam earlier, for example. That aren't that small. They're both bigger than the well, UK. They, sure. In but, land area but, and population. Sorry, smaller powers, <laughs> yeah, right. larger, larger yeah. physical states. So what, what can we do to, to improve our credibility in the region? So my experience, what we did is we convened a lot. We had uh, events in, um, in some of these bigger, bigger countries where we could host events at the, uh, the you know, it, it's not to be underestimated, the ability of us to convene, to have themes about um, exports, trying to, particularly after Brexit, um, you know, the business of trying to promote Britain abroad in that way and try and show some leadership. So, and I think also on the climate change agenda, we've been quite active through our embassies about helping other countries and where we can using the international aid budget as well to make sure that we promote good outcomes. But it's, it's, it's a fair question. Where can we try to provide leadership internationally? I would say on convening on trade and trying to lead on some specific things and on climate change might be a good one because you know the UK and many other countries but the UK particularly is fizzing with people with businesses with ideas about technology about how to improve how to adjust in order to reduce carbon emissions I'd say that's quite a good area I, I would agree I think that that convening power and uh, working on areas like climate and trade uh, are indeed very important I would add to that two things one would be the importance of bilateral dialogues that are really comprehensive uh, and not just about trade or just about climate or just about defense, but are really sort of a, a, a systematic and comprehensive commitment to a, a full relationship. Uh, and I would prioritize, if I were the UK government, uh, certain states in East and Southeast Asia in particular, uh, as I think indeed the government has, in the case of Japan and Australia, and long-standing uh, commitments as well to Singapore and Malaysia. But I would also very strongly think about Thailand and Vietnam, uh, as well as the Philippines uh, and Indonesia. I think that, that you can't really have a Southeast Asia policy that bypasses the state that's bigger than the rest of the region combined, uh, and at least thinks of itself as a regional leader. Um, and those are not relationships that I think the UK has prioritized in the recent past. Uh, I mean, pre-World War II to some extent, yes. But you know, since World War II, not really has the UK prioritized those relationships in the region. Uh, and I think it should. Uh, the second thing I would mention is other kinds of soft power. And there's a whole range of things there that I think, at least in the public discourse, are seldom brought up, uh, but are worth considering. Uh, banking and finance regulation, as well as just leadership in the sector, um, is an area where the UK can have significant influence uh, and, in fact, in some cases, exert significant control uh, in ways that affect profoundly the economies of many other countries uh, in those sectors. Uh, shipping and insurance, if we're talking about South China Sea, would be other sectors uh, where the UK can have a significant role uh, and almost always does have a significant role, actually. Uh, and then finally, other areas like law, media, and communications. Uh, and if we look at sort of law, media, communications, publishing, all of those things, it's a power to influence discourse as much as anything else. It's, it's sort of at the soft end of soft power. Um, and I think that that power is far greater, actually, than many in this country really appreciate. Uh, and some of that is just down to the power of English language, uh, but also existing sort of media publishing and, and other structures uh, that have quite an extensive reach in East and Southeast Asia, much more, I think, than is sometimes appreciated. Uh, 
Um, and, and that could be a, a significant lever of influence, although not necessarily in a very rigid or ham-fisted way, because then you lose it. Right? If, if you're too brute force about, we're now going to control the discourse through Soft the media. Power. Exactly. I would add to that cultural initiatives, yeah. which actually the UK does quite well yeah. too. Could I add a hard power version of soft power? So um, countries like, because um, when you're looking at them, you think, well, which are the states where, which are essentially natural allies and which are the ones that are not, not straightforward allies? Um, and how do you develop relations in different ways when you're the other side of the world and you're culturally very different? And Indonesia will be a really good example where particularly the Australians, um, but actually also the Brits after the Bali bombing, built up an incredibly close relationship um, on a security front in, in order to keep the population safe and, and you know, with the self-interest in order to keep our tourists safe. Yes. And that relationship, once you've built it up, if you maintain it, it endures. And, and it's, it's a critical part of how governments work in, in in most governments. So it's being really conscious about um, when you develop those relationships, maintaining them and fostering them so that the country that wouldn't necessarily think, oh, we need an ally, let's go to the UK, actually does think they've been constant, they've been helpful, um, we, you know, we appreciate them, we want to help them back. Um, that's, that's what you're aiming to get out of these relationships. So, so in a weird way, I always think, Hard power can be a really good soft power if it's used in a constructive way. Yeah. Um, uh, two more questions. Uh, Hugo at the back. I think these will be our last two questions and then we'll have to draw it to a close. Will we? Okay, we will. I'm going to be irritating and ask a broad one. Um, I was really struck by your point that we've had a completely different conversation since 2015. One of the main aspects of that from our perspective has been the emergence of Indo-Pacific as a term that everyone uses all the time. And that's really grown and changed. Um, I'm not sure how well it's been interrogated. So my question to all three panelists in your own perspectives, whether that's in politics, in communication, in academia, or in law, is the Indo-Pacific as a term, Bill, I know you run our Indo-Pacific program, so you're gonna say yes to this, but is, our, is the Indo-Pacific as a term useful in conversations with the audiences that matter? And if so, why? And does that explain why we've chosen to adopt it with such force and such vigor in recent years? Well, I mean, I, I don't feel necessarily that I know much about that because it, it's new since I, I left, really. The whole tilt towards the Indo-Pacific has been much more recent in the past few years. But I would agree with you, it may need spelling out quite what it means, because also, if you choose one sector, you're, you're letting go of others. So it's, uh, it needs to be explained a bit better, perhaps, by the UK government in relative terms to other choices. I don't necessarily think it's the most useful or only useful term or, or conceptualization of a region that maximally conceived includes about two thirds of the world. Um, I think it, it's originally something that was articulated by Japan at least in its, in its current iteration. Uh, and that has been taken up with some vigor in Japan and then more broadly in policy circles uh, in the UK, throughout much of Europe, in the US, uh, et cetera. Um, it is a term sometimes that it's quite irritating, at least in, in certain ways to China uh, and others, uh, which may or may not be uh, a reason to use it or not to use it. Um, but I think it's useful importantly in one key way, which is that when we think of the Pacific or Asia Pacific, there's a temptation to concentrate almost to the exclusion of anything else on Northeast Asia. And, and sort of, you know, Japan, Korea, maybe China. Um, and maximally perhaps Taiwan, Hong Kong included inside China. Whereas Indo-Pacific at least forces anyone thinking about it also to take into account Southeast Asia. And I really think quite strongly that Southeast Asia is the neglected gigantic piece of the puzzle um, in so much of thinking around Asian politics more broadly. Um, now, if we extend even further, then we talk about Indian Ocean and, and South Asia and, and politics there, 
which I agree is, is essentially important. The question is whether we can really link these under one umbrella and whether that really makes sense or whether we should be thinking of them in three separate areas, uh, at least three separate areas, if not four. Um, and that to me is really an open question in terms of utility, but I think it's worth sticking with the idea of Indo-Pacific at least because it forces us to think about all of these places. That again, as I would point you know, you've I'm sure all seen that meme with the circle drawn around uh, essentially Southeast Asia, most of China, part of Japan, Korea, and most of India. And the little caption says, far more people live inside this circle than outside of it, which is true. There's also more GDP inside that circle than outside of it. Um, and so in that sense, that circle is the Indo-Pacific. And it helps at least to hone our focus, not just on Japan, not just on China or, or Northeast Asia, uh, but on Southeast Asia and potentially also Indian Ocean and South Asia uh, in a way that I think is instructive and also uh, that it behooves us all to think about, uh, but we too seldom do. Did you have any comments on that, Tom? You don't have oh, to. Very, you do, only in a very general sense. I mean, lawyers are inveterate institutionalists. We like to look at things that have a degree of concrete concreteness to them, even if the concreteness is shallow. Uh, but but it, lawyers, international lawyers, have, have noted that this region, Indo-Pacific region, inside, inside that great big circle where everybody lives and most of the productivity is, is the least institutionalized at the international, at the public international level. Uh, Africa has its African Union and ECOWAS, as well as some other groupings. Latin America has its Court of Human Rights. It has its Mercosur. Uh, North America has uh, its, its uh, successor to NAFTA. Europe speaks for itself with the Union, the most deeply integrated public law body that's ever existed. So here you have this huge chunk of the world, the larger chunk of the world, with the least institutionalized international law. Now, maybe that's just a lawyer's, lawyer, I, I preface this by saying lawyers perhaps pay too much attention to institutionalization, but it is interesting that, uh, that those countries have that in common. And did we have one, um, oh God, we've got two final questions. What time are we finishing now? Imminently. Quick, we've got four minutes. Okay, we've got four minutes. So the at the back. Uh, thank you, I'll make it quick. Um, I'm a PhD student at uh, Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. And just coming from the two gentlemen's questions that was asked just earlier, I think it just really demonstrates how distant the UK is actually from the Indo-Pacific. And obviously the term has been used in the region for several years now. And by the fact that we are debating whether this term is relevant or not itself, I think really te is a testament to how, how distant we, the UK is from the region. And um, Professor Hurst rightfully mentioned that we should prioritize the relationships with you know, Southeast Asian countries and regional bilateral relations, but you know, given by this geographical nature, after all, East Asian countries are sec naturally second tier or perhaps even third tier partners for the UK, I believe. And, you know, when, so, and even like looking at the trade relations, apart from China, none of the East Asian countries actually fit into top 10 partners for the UK, and given these reality, how do we really make sense of their importance for the UK, and what really is the UK's appetite to really engage with the region, other than perhaps the you know, former great power status the UK once had? Thank you, and actually, can we take the other question at the same time, which is, yeah, and then, and then we'll answer them both together. Yeah, of course. Um, so mine was just, I um, have assumed from what you were saying earlier, that there wasn't really any uh, high-level diplomatic communication between uh, China and, and the UK in the scenario that you were working through earlier. And I want to ask how common that really is to have sort of so little uh, direct communication between, you know, certainly not enemies at, at this point, you know, they are uh, sort of uh, in communication with each other normally, and how common it is to have to resort to back-channel communication to really get the information that you actually need. I suppose, Amber, that's mainly for you. Well, I would say back-channel communications are an essential part of all diplomacy and all, you know, encounters of the ones like the one we, we saw today. And the, the better they work, the less likely we are to have any sort of confrontation. Um, obviously, the relationships with uh, different countries' um, leaders are likely to be dependent on the good terms. But also, and this discuss we discussed this morning, very much about the relationship. You know, and that, that applies not just for the prime ministers and presidents, but also for the secretaries of state. 
uh, you know, most secretaries of state go out of their way to go and see and to speak to the secretary of state from uh, ally countries and even ones that aren't necessarily ally countries. I mean, when I was home secretary, I went, you know, every time there was an incident for us, 2017, as Suzanne said, was a terrible year of attacks and I would get uh, endless phone calls of sympathy from the Germans, from the French, and I thought I was getting on with them really well. And then uh, Theresa May, the Prime Minister at the time, said to me, oh, yes, I used to go on holiday with them. I'm like, oh, my Lord, <laughs> that is some commitment. But um, getting to know your opposite numbers is a way, again, of avoiding difficulties. And to the first question I would just say briefly is, um, I am not and never have been somebody who advocated leaving the EU. And tomorrow is an anniversary after seven years, and I will have a quiet moment to myself. However, having done that, we absolutely need to maximise our relationships with the countries outside the EU. And I, you know, the people who did support Brexit, most of whom are in government now, and if we get a future Labour government, they will take the same approach. We're not as close to the EU and we're not able to trade as freely. We need to make sure we do better outside the EU. And some of those high growth countries would be ideal. Bill, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think just very, very quickly uh, on why is the Indo-Pacific important to the UK? I mean, aside from big places like India, Pakistan, the Southeast Asian states that we've been talking about, China, you know, if we think, think about just Japan and South Korea, right? Japan is an absolutely essential partner for the UK in security terms, in economic terms, technological terms, educational terms, right across the board. South Korea as well, uh, and, and increasingly so, uh, particularly in high tech sectors and, and, and the like. But even if we think about Ukraine, European countries donating all of this kit to Ukraine wouldn't be able to do that as fully as they have and as, as confidently as they have without South Korea providing huge amounts of artillery shells. True. Something as basic as that because South Korea has stockpiled so many artillery shells because of the threat from North Korea, uh, that they're willing to share a large, a large portion of that. And that wasn't absolutely straightforward. That took actually some interesting, complex and lengthy negotiations over convincing South Korea to do that. Uh, but the fact that they have is absolutely pivotal for something going on in Europe that has ostensibly nothing to do with the region. So yes, these places are really important. Um, I forget what the second question really was. About dialogue between... Dialogue, dialogue. Uh, yeah. I think what, what's interesting to me about this idea that the perception that there was a big shift in 2015 vis-a-vis -vis China, China's position didn't change in 2015. <laughs> China's position really hasn't changed very much in terms of its international posture since the late 1990s, early 2000s. Right? There's been only marginal shifts. It's other countries that have shifted vis-a-vis -vis China in a very significant way. And where I would date that to more than 2015 is 2017 and the US trade war. Yeah. That sort of came out of the blue for China. I mean, this was the, the ultimate sort of Trumpian uh, stroke uh, from nowhere. Um, and that, that China was very much on the back foot about and that it had to respond to from its point of view. But really since then, if we look at the last six years or so, I think there's been a huge sort of fall off a cliff in terms of dialogue between China and other states. Uh, certainly other states that are less closely tied to China's own orbit. Um, and so not just the UK, not just Europe, but the US, Japan, South Korea, a number of others. There's been a real downgrading of, of those dialogues. And I think what has happened recently that I would argue is a quite positive development that hasn't been acted upon, again, I think because of domestic politics in various countries, China now, post-COVID, has been trying to restart those dialogues. Yeah. Not necessarily offer any concessions or conciliations, uh, but at least to reactivate re kind of the, the mechanisms of, of conversation. Uh, or argument or, or standoff, whatever it might be, but at least talking to other countries. Not all other countries are taking that up. In fact, most are not, certainly not to the degree China would like. And I would argue not to the degree perhaps that they should. Um, again, not necessarily to offer concessions or conciliation, but to at least begin again that dialogue. Um, and I, I would posit that that's largely because of domestic politics inside those other states. I agree. Yeah. 
I'm going to plug um, the podcast that we do for the Centre for Geopolitics on geopolitics, um, which has a double episode called Knowing Your Enemy. And we asked that question because we realised that um, a number of kind of world famous enemies like Hitler and Churchill never met. Um, there was a really interesting moment in 1942 where the ambassador in Moscow said to Churchill, you've never met Stalin, you've got to go and meet him because if you can't have a personal relationship with Stalin, it's really difficult to see how we're going to work out Europe. They were allies, though. In they 1942, were allies, but they, they're not they were allies, but they'd never met. Right. And, and so that really interesting question about whether, whether you reduce or increase the risk of some kind of conflict if you know personally your enemy if, if you can just pick up the phone and and and, and it's we don't answer the question because of course lots of people have met Putin but it hasn't meant that you know so so it's not straightforward but there are some really interesting examples of people who just didn't meet and ended up you know in conflicts with one of them ending up dead so so have a listen I'm going to draw this to a close now thank you very much thank you um, to our three marvelous panelists um, for um, just brilliant insights and grateful for your time and so interesting. Thank you to the audience for being here, for sitting through this not inconsiderable heat. Um, and um, this will all be on YouTube so you can watch it again. And thank you to our YouTube audience for staying the course. Okay, thank you. Thank you.